Hi. So in my several decades of working for Bioneers and in other consulting gigs, I've had to review hundreds and hundreds of projects from all around the world, seeking in a variety of different ways and at different scales to address the great crises facing humanity. And it's really inspiring to see so many hardworking, heroic people coming up with creative solutions to all kinds of problems. But, and I'm going to be brutally honest here, it can also be very depressing. And the reason it can be depressing is that the crises facing us are so severe and unfolding so rapidly that we need, even though you know, small-scale projects and medium-scale projects can, can be great and are worth supporting, we desperately need um, initiatives that can scale up, that can really have a major impact globally, and that are also democratically and part based on participation, that are not top-down technocratic fixes. Sadly, very few such projects come to my attention. But fortunately for the planet and my own mental sanity, um, there are such projects. And our next speaker is someone who has just such an endeavor. I first became aware of Alex Eaton's work when I was working as a review team member for the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, which had a 10-year run that just ended last year in its initial, um, in, in that particular iteration. And I want to give a shout out to the great genius who was the prime mover of the Buckminster Fuller Challenge, Elizabeth Thompson, who I may be out here in the audience somewhere, but it was an honor working for her and with her. Um, but Alex Eaton is the um, co-founder and the CEO of something called Sistema Bio. And Sistema Bio is a project that began in Mexico and Central America and then has spread virally, rapidly into Africa, into Asia. And it's a patented biogas system that takes animal, human, and agricultural waste and converts it into energy and into fertilizer. And what's amazing about the project is that it's both visionary and extremely practical. And it has major, major positive impacts, cascading positive impacts on rural livelihoods. And of course, we know that modern industrial agriculture is one of the most destructive human activities. So we desperate, but what people don't know is that 80% of the world's food is still grown by subsistence farmers around the world. So there is absolutely nothing that is more important in terms of ecological health, social stability, um, and you know, just uh, reducing poverty than really helping small subsistence farmers be more sustainable. It's important on every level for climate mitigation, for human health, you know, to prevent hundreds of millions of people from going into rural slums around the world that are, you know, ex in extremely terrible living conditions. And so Alex's project is really one that is a game changer. Um, it really um, yeah, it, it, it thrills me when I run into such a project because when I, in the darkest hours, when I get depressed and suddenly see, well, you know what, maybe there is a shot. Maybe there are things that can really scale up and have a, an, an enormous impact on people's lives. So I'll let him describe, of course, his project because it's his and he knows way more about it than I do. But it's a great honor to be able to welcome a real game changer, Alex Eaton. Wow. This room is huge. Bioneers, hi. Thank you for creating such a beautiful space, uh, for sharing ideas. Um, I'm Alex Eaton. This is Sistema Bio. I want to explain to you a little bit about the work we do with small farmers. So uh, for us, uh, anybody here like small farmers? Yeah. All right. Small farmers for us are farmers that are family-based, they're locally-based, they're community-based. They're intimately working a small piece of land, but together that patchwork of small farmers is actually uh, managing the majority of arable land on Earth. We, we help small farmers transform all of their waste into clean, renewable energy and organic fertilizer. I started this work about 10 years ago as an exploration on, on how biogas digesters, something that had been around for a really long time, could work for small farmers and move out of a homemade realm of uh, bricks and mortar and actually move into something that could be uh, scalable, rep replicable, and could actually hit the hundreds of millions of small farms around the world. So we were doing a very small demo project uh, about 10 years ago in, uh, in, in central Mexico. And this young man named Enrique came up to me and he said, um, I don't want my mom to be sick anymore. She cooks six, eight hours a day over an open fire, 
and she has to go to the hospital all the time because her lug lungs are filled with smoke. They're in fact uh, really sort of basically have this inflammation. And you know, this is what we had really thought about. How do we convert waste to energy so people don't have to cook over wood fuel? And, uh, but then he said, I also haven't seen my dad in five years. He migrated to the United States to work when our farm wasn't making enough money. And I really want to make enough money so that he can come home. If I don't, I'm probably going to have to migrate too. So uh, that challenge uh, was a really, really sort of important and, and uh, huge, uh, basically, call out for us. So we installed a system with Enrique. We gave him a 10-month loan to pay that system off. And basically, within a month, his mom was able to uh, remove wood fuel from their kitchen. Uh, they, she not only was cooking for the family, but they also make this delicious yogurt that they sold locally. The organic fertilizer uh, was used in his fields that he had basically had to abandon because they couldn't afford synthetic fertilizer, chemical fertilizer inputs. He increased his yield. That fodder went to the, the cows. They were able to increase their milk production. Uh, they reactivated the small orchard that they had of small indigenous fruits in, in central Mexico, which they added to the yogurt, and, and they started selling more yogurt, uh, producing more food. The next season, uh, he paid off the loan a couple months early. The next season, they, they planted twice as much crops as the year before, and Enrique's father was there to help them harvest back at the family farm. And, and what I learned in that uh, time is that the object, the technology, the, the actual sort of literal intervention that we had had very little to do with this broader spectrum of how small farmers are integrated both in our uh, larger economic and social structure. And so uh, over the years that really helped influence us and the people we work with. And I could tell you about a man running in, in Kenya, running a new milk cooperative to empower small farmers. Uh, a woman-run dairy in India, which is actually a really phenomenal advancement, using this technology, making their resources go a lot farther. And so uh, now today I can say that we've done that 30,000 times around the world. And yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of amazing stories. They're, they're quite different, they're quite unique because small farmers inherently are so di uh, different, unique. They have all these different uh, stories, but they all sort of fall around a couple central themes. So I can, we have enough data points to say that this technology, this approach could lift two billion people out of poverty. And the, the, the externalities of that would be reducing greenhouse gases, it would be essentially converting waste to energy, and it would be building a deep, beautiful soil for these farmers to continue to work in. So 2.5 billion people live on small farms. That's one in three people. Uh, that was a surprising fact for me, because I actually grew up on a small farm, uh, and it was a little weird to be the, the, the stinky kid that, um, that had to work harder than his friends. There weren't a lot of small farmers in our community, but the small farmers that we uh, did work with were some of the, the closest friends to our family because we shared this ethic around environmental sustainability, how we were connected to the earth. And essentially, when I uh, later became a journalist and was traveling around the world thinking about this cross-section of social justice and environmental sustainability, I realized that small farmers were at the, the heart of a lot of these stories, and that was really exciting for me because these were my people. These are the people that I had grown up with. I shared a lot more with a Kenyan farmer or a Mexican farmer than I did with a lot of the people that I had grown up with just because of that shared ethic. And so, um, but the next thing I learned was that smallholder farmers were growing 80% of the food that is consumed on earth, yet if you listen to sort of industrial agriculture and, and the propaganda around the food system, you'd make it sound like small farmers really just need to get out of the way because you have to go big or go home. And so that was an amazing realization. These are, this is a really important group of people. However, they're the group of people most likely to go to bed hungry. And that irony was something that really started to bother me early on. A billion of the world's poorest people are farmers. But the reality is, is that we define poverty in, the, in a whole different way than I think we should. Small farmers are managing more than half of the world's arable lands. And it, crucially, in, a, in, a, in an economy that really recognizes the value of information, they are holding so much cultural knowledge. They are holding so much deep uh, indigenous heritage. And, and in Mexico, yeah. Uh, 
And in Mexico, I mean, they've been farming for four and 5,000 years, and it's, so it's really humbling to try to come in and, uh, and try to introduce new techniques to these farmers. But the reality is, is that we're not talking about uh, uninterrupted indigenous knowledge. If we were, I think uh, we'd be in a very, very different situation. But the reality is neoliberal economics, colonialism, in some cases genocide, these things have interrupted that ancestral knowledge. There's been a lot of money spent to sort of uh, undermine the value of that knowledge. Um, but these, these are the farmers that are working very, very closely with the land. They have very, very special bond to their local environment, and that is worth a lot. And um, they're not poor. I believe they're not poor, but they have a lot of challenges, right? So waste management, um, either if you're big or small, really uh, concentrated agricultural waste is what is really creating dead zones in the ocean, choking out our lakes and rivers. Um, most small farmers are still cooking over an open fire. So that's what we've done for millennia, three stone fire. So they, and they're spending a lot of money and time to collect that wood. Uh, and that's impacting their health like it did for Enrique's mom. And finally, today, with all of our creativity, the only answer that the international community has for small farmers around the world to improve their yields is add chemical fertilizer and pesticides. It's crazy. Today, still, the green revolution is the only answer that's being proposed for small farmers. And so these challenges for us are extremely important and what we realize is that farmers don't have technology, training, capacity building, or financing. Really, these very basic things that industrial farmers have access to, small farmers don't have access to those things. So um, our work is fundamentally a very simple but beautiful alchemy. We're transforming something they already have, but something that's considered gross, disgusting waste, the universal shit, and we're transforming it into something beautiful, in this case, a beautiful blue flame. This is renewable energy, and what we're doing is uh, essentially um, making farmers more productive by creating value from waste. And uh, this is important because a lot of our work is to really sort of challenge the concept of waste. In natural ecosystems, there is no waste, right? You're just, there's products for other, for other systems, for other processes. And so we really need to start thinking like that as a society, but also in particular, as, as farms. So what we try to do in, with a, a very simple model is basically use a simple piece of technology that allows farmers to do that on their farm. So uh, we create these, these extensions of a cow's stomach, essentially these micro ecosystems that allow bacteria, actually the original form of life on Earth, that uh, single-celled bacteria that existed before there was free oxygen that had been created by plants, these bacteria broke down organic waste, and the byproduct of that is methane gas, natural gas, that we capture in the top of this uh, big, essentially, bladder, and that gets captured, and then we can pipe that for cooking fuels, running small engines, chilling, pumping water, doing all the things that small farmers don't have access to. And then what's basically happening is these organic chains are being broken down, the nutrients that are in that waste are being put in a plant available form, and then can be easily recycled back into the soil to help create deeper soils. Thank you. What that looks like is, um, is this, uh, a woman that would normally be sitting in a smoky kitchen now has an on-demand beautiful flame, uh, and a woman that would normally not have access to electricity is able to run a small dairy. Um, people that would normally be spending an, an, uh, an enormous amount of time cutting up fodder, milking animals, carrying water, now have access to mechanical energy for all of these simple things. And that's a massive time saver. And also, we've got this plant available form that instead of having to move tons and tons of waste, we can pump this beautiful liquid fertilizer back into the ground. And for larger extensions, we can actually run tractors with this compressed natural gas. We can add a lot of capacity to the farmers so that we can actually viably put a ton of land under organic management. We pair that with um, a, a huge amount of outreach. So we're all around the world. We have 150 dedicated promoters uh, that in 15 different languages today are promoting the technology. They're local leaders. They're empowering people to understand the technology. It's not actually super logical that 
that shit turns into money. So we really have to sort of uh, <laughs> explain that to people uh, in a way that they can understand and, and with people that trust us. And then what we learned early on is just make sure it works. Provide world-class service to ensure that these farmers get the promise of the technology and it works for them every single time. Uh, we're, we're able to do that because we use a little bit of technology. All of our farmers are recorded with GPS on a cloud-based database that allows us to see exactly where they are in the world, allows us to create connectivity between farmers and ensure that they get the system and the adoption programming that they need. Now, we realize that we can't try to change the world by putting ourselves into the same financial framework that farmers have been uh, exposed to this whole entire time. When we started in Mexico, the average interest rate for a loan for a small farmer was over 100% annual. Can you imagine what that does to the small margins that they have on their work? So what we did is just decided, uh, working with Kiva and others, we built a, uh, a crowd-based funding platform that allowed us to extend 0% interest loans to farmers. We made sure that they didn't have to pay. Yeah. I wish I had access to zero interest loans too, but this in this case is, is really make sure that they don't have to pay when they're buying seeds, they don't have to pay when they're buying school uniforms. We really try to dive into farmers' lives and extend the payment program to, so that they could actually be paying only with the savings that they had. We actually try to make sure that they're cash flow positive right from the very, very beginning. And then when they pay off the equipment, that means that all of those savings can be reinvested back in the farm. So. Technology, service, financing, and uh, we've been able to expand all around the world, which is really super exciting for us. Um, we've, we've basically tripled in size over the last two years. Um, we started in Mexico, now we're serving all of Latin America um, through Central America and, and the Andean region. Uh, we have a hub in East Africa that's allowing us to work in Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya. And uh, we've just opened an office in India that has been really humbling and amazing. These are all cultures that have been farming for millennia. And to really be able to add something to that conversation, really help empower those people has been an incredible honor. So we've learned a couple things and I'm gonna go fast. Um, uh, a couple of, a, a few things, and if anyone doubts this next fact, <laughs> exactly. The future of farming is female. Um, and, and that's a very, very important fact. And we, we really tried to lean into that early on. Um, most of our promoters are females. A huge chunk of our technicians are females. That connection, that empowerment of women is, it impacts way outside of just energy, climate change, or agriculture. It's really helping. It's really the single most important thing I think that we can do. And so having that be uh, a cross section of everything that we do, thinking how women are leaders in this, really ensures that these benefits come back to the communities. Um, the other thing uh, is that farmers deserve high quality uh, technology and world class service. There's a, uh, a whole school of thought within development which is let's just let the markets take care of it and neoliberal economics basically will let you know that small farmers and the poorest people will be given really cheap stuff. The Walmart model, right? Something that is inexpensive but breaks really easy. And growing, growing up on a farm, that's not what we valued. We valued things that lasted a really long time, things that you could repair yourselves. And that's really what uh, farmers and, and really the poor in general need access to. It's not cheap goods. And, and the, the most important thing, and actually part of the, the title of this talk, is that you really need to connect with people's hearts, you need to connect with culture, and you need to do that um, by being really open to integrate your work and see how it fits into other people's cosmovision, other people's worldviews, and into their culture. And we've done that in a couple different ways, and I just want to share very quickly. Um, early on in our work, we were working in, with Mayan communities in the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, yeah, it has really an amazing culture and, and an amazing group of people, and they were, they were calling the system um, El Nuevo Fuego, the new flame. And I was like, wow, the new flame. In my culture, the flame is the grandfather of grandfathers, right? The original essence, the original being. So thinking about creating a new flame was a really powerful concept. And in this community, they actually had a legend around a dragon that had come out of a cenote. And in their, their legend, it ate babies. And I didn't really love that part. So we started rethinking some of the methodology. And, um, and so we, we came up with this dragon uh, that ate shit and breathed fire uh, as an alternative 
And, and we, we told this whole story about it. And probably the pinnacle of uh, my professional career was when this was uh, approved by the Mexican uh, education secretary. And we literally had 300 teachers and 1,000 students dressed as shit-eating dragons <laughs> running around saying, caca es vida, and uh, singing songs. And uh, yeah, the trickster in me really loved the problem uh, student in me really loved that moment. And, and so that connection, I think, is what makes our work really, really powerful uh, and, and thinking about that. So we're, we're the tribe of the new flame, really thinking about how the, the similarities in farmers around the world are actually much more significant than their differences. And I think that that cross-section, that community that we're building is really, really powerful. And so um, at the end of all of our demonstration events, we invite everybody to become the fire-breathing dragons that we all are in some ways. Um, so what are we doing in the future? What we're really trying to do is uh, do what we're doing today, but a hundred and millions of times larger. We really want to figure out how this can reach many, many more farmers. We're also seeing that our platform uh, can process invasive aquatic plants. We can actually take human waste. We can take food waste from markets. There's a number of other ways that this platform, this technology, can actually start impacting farmers and agriculture. Um, we see this as part of a circular economy. How can farmers disconnect themselves from this neoliberal trap of having to buy their inputs, being sort of stuck with these intermediaries that are buying their products for lower prices, being marginalized because most of the money they make has to leave their economy, no? How can they sell organic fertilizer to their neighbors? How can they be processing the agricultural products locally? And uh, what we really have our eyes on is a million farmers as soon as we possibly can. And the beautiful thing about this is, imagine six million people cooking on clean energy, having access to organic fertilizer. Imagine saving hundreds of millions of trees and reducing tens of millions of greenhouse gases and putting an area the size of California's vegetable gardens under organic management. It's something we're really, really working for as fast as we can. And I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna steal an extra minute. Um only because um, I think it's really powerful to see so many young people here today. The saying we use really often is the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Uh, we're really uh, impacted by this IPCC report, but I think it's something we all knew. We really have to work super, super hard and we have to plant those, those trees today. And seeing all these young people here is really inspiring because this is the group that needs to take this torch forward. Um, I met these children uh, when the middle child hadn't even been born yet and they were so young. Uh, they will never know a time in which their mom goes to the forest to harvest wood fuel. They will never know a time in which they dump chemicals on their land to grow food. They will never know a time in which waste is something gross. It's something beautiful that transforms into their energy and their resources. This is the frame change we need to change the world, and these are our future leaders. So join me in supporting them, and thank you very much.